thanks for your attention. So I'm talking about a topic which is called translational science, which means just learning from the lab side. I'm a physiologist, so I'm interested in the physiology behind the scenes. And the main important, the most important question in the afternoon session is the following question. Should I stay or should I go? Because beautiful weather outside maybe, <laughs> good coffee, good lunch break. As I try to be a researcher, I want to use the audience as my, as my experience, as my experiment group. So please take out your remote controls. So and now people are signing in. And you can make up your mind. What was your personal answer to the quiz stone test question? Should I, should I stay or should I go now? We try to find the correct answer. <laughs> so well, very clear question, isn't it? So we've got a distribution. So this means that the answer and the question does not fit, probably. Or maybe I can convince those who said, yes, I want to go, which I don't know, is it the number C? Is it uh, number B? Or should I stay? So it's maybe yes. So I want to convince those who are not one, trying to stay in the lecture hall that they stay. I will tell you in the following 20 minutes the secrets of everlasting youth, zero <laughs> CO2 emission, and elimination of muscle pain, which is probably what you expect in a 20 minutes talk. So let's go for the everlasting youth. So this lady looks pretty good. I think she's more than 600 years old, but she has a very good shape because you can even have an impression on her face. You can see how she's lying there and it's all about fascia, because if you have no fascia there, you just ha have a bunch of bones which falls together. So this is, fascia is important for our body structure. And so this is a very impressive example. And so another question to the audience, what do you think? Because she's quite dry, isn't she? How much water do we lose during our lifetime? And I can you tell you in advance, there are not good data about it. It's an important matter of fact that you need to bind water in your body, otherwise you look like the lady and you look a bit rusty. So, number D is the top. And in fact, that's what literature says. Let's just have a look at the graph. And I've think this is amazing that you lose 30% of water during your lifetime. And what does this have to do with fascia? I want to show you the, the type of proteins water is bound. And this, this type of protein is called proteoglycans. You've got albumin in your blood. You've got um, proteoglycans in the, in the fascial tissue. And so this is the protein where all water is bound. So if you calculate the content of, of water, which is bound there, you need to know that the molecule looks more or less like a toilet brush, which has branches everywhere. You can shake it, it gets dry, and suck water in again. So this means that it, there is a very plastic way of changing um, physical conditions, physiological conditions, and this is what Robert and myself did in the laboratory. We stretched, stretched uh, fascial tissue, and what you usually get, you get this initial peak and then a relaxation phenomenon. After rest, you did a second stretch, and so the tension increases. And so what might be the reason for this? The reason can be found in parts, probably, in dehydration, in the water content of the fascial tissue, and have a look at the, at the time scale. Initially, after the stretch, you pour out water. That's probably what you do expect. But what the surprising thing was that after a while, the water gets sucked in, and even more water gets sucked in than to the baseline level. 
So this means that if you use some kind of stretch, you can actually influence the hydration of the tissue. And so the hydration depends on other things. If you look at water, it is a polar thing. So it's a polar uh, atom. And so you have even different bonds because this depends on the polarity of the molecules. So if you bind the water in a polar condition, it is a um, hydrophobic component and you've got lubricant uh, properties of the tissue, whereas on the other side, if you have a hydrophilic condition, as in aging, it is rather glue-like. So it sticks together everything. And so this is probably where the hyaluronic acid kicks in, because then you've got a, another thing which can turn the glue-like condition to lubricant conditions. So what changes from hydrophilic conditions into hydrophobic? This is in the lab is done by Andre Sommer et al. They used light at a specific wavelength to change the water from glue-like to lubricant, but we also know that motion, maybe specific manual therapy, can uh, do this change. Basically what the aim is to have around your molecules uh, a chef of uh, water bonds, which is really making the, the tissue slide against each other without damage. So that's basically like Starship Enterprise. So then you're pretty protected, aren't you? So next slide. So this is one which I um, really want to show because this shows that you can get everlasting youth. Basically, this guy looks healthy because not because of his muscles only, but also because of the intersections. The intersections are facial intersections. So basically, different type of muscle, different shape, and the shape and structure, as in the rusty lady, even in the healthy and fit guy, depends on water bond binding and uh, on the facial anatomy. So let me go on to the CO2 emission. So if you no, Germans try to be very efficient, so we try to uh, find ways to save energy. So I want to ask you a question about a study which has done by Franklin Miller et al. So he just raises the leg and defines the posterior tie as 100%. I can give you a clue, the Achilles tendon will be 100% as well, so I want to know how much tension is transferred to the lumbar fascia? What's your guess? So in fact, they found that the lumbar fascia has 145% in comparison to this. So this means that strain is transferred to the upper uh, system of the, of the lumbar spine. So this is really a surprising effect. And so if you look back in old literature, this is uh, old literature from the 80s, which was published in Nature, quite a good paper then. So they found that a specific tribe in Africa, they can carry up to 70% of their own body weight on the head without additional energy expenditure. So if we look at the European way of using uh, our muscles, then you can find a one-to-one -one relationship. So what is uh, different in those women? They have a specific type of gait, and one um, collaborator of our group, he suggested that this might be due to the elastic function, the energy storage function of the lumbar fascia. So this is not just a cartoon, but it's also based on uh, mathematical calculations with the Lagrange uh, statistics. So I want to know what is, in your opinion, the prevailing effect of fascia in terms of locomotion? Is it energy storage, in your opinion? Does it most importantly enable sliding? Does it do force modulation, force transmission? Is this the main function? Or pre-stretch of sarcomeres? Okay. So we've got a pretty good percentage, probably. 
how, what the different functions are. Of course, all different functions will occur. Next one, elimination of muscle pain. And this is, this is, is an easy one for me, because elimination of muscle pain, it's just by eliminating the word, because it, there is not just muscle pain, there are several structures there, so you can't say muscle pain alone. There is the nerves, the vessels, the fascia, of course, and the muscle. So the prototype of every fascial disease is a nerve entrapment syndrome, which means that nerves are wrapped in very lubricant uh, sliding uh, com components. And so if you've got an entrapment of the nerve, then you can uh, get really in trouble because the nerve is not any more fully functional and so will get stressed, will get strained. And then as we have a problem with innovation, so you can get atrophy, you can get uh, persistent um, problems if you don't treat so beforehand. So this is a normal fascia above the ulnar nerve, this is the flexor carpi ulnaris, and then you see a thickening of the fascia, but the thickening of the fascia might be anyway on the ulnar nerve, and so what you, you can do if it's no other use, if everything failed, you can just try to find the nerve, and then I want to show you how the fascia looks like if it's really hurting the nerve and damaging the nerve, that's the thickening of the fascia. And you can see that it's really, really tight tissue. And so the nerve is compressed under there and cannot function anymore. And so if we can avoid this operation with manual therapies, it's probably a good approach to use fascial techniques. So I just want to show you how far it's in. So it's about... 15 centimeters all along the nerve there can be the compression syndromes and um, all over the many many of the operations are done only locally but then this is not uh, enough sometimes fascial innovation is a big issue we learned from uh, Siegfried Menze that there are nerve endings which contain substance P and calcitonin gene related peptide he showed beautiful pictures, but I think he don't, didn't mention that both substances are associated to chronic pain. So this is an important uh, thing for me, that uh, chronic pain is associated to the nerves found in fascial tissue. And he also proved that it's functionally relevant. So it's in a physiological level, is it relevant? So, and we also know that fascial components can be easily remodeled. So you have a remodeling of the fascial components. So this means that in other words, the innovation and the remodeling can work together and change tissue behavior. This has been found in, in back pain patients, and indeed I did a spelling error here, it's male back pain patients, so they found that uh, there is an increase of uh, fascial thickness. And remember, there is a lot of innovation there. And remember, it can be remodeled if you use those um, cells, those myofibroblasts in the, in the tissue. So, and it, indeed, it's thicker if you lose the ultrasound. So this is an important finding. And so this transfers the knowledge from basic science into clinics, and so you really have an example for this. So this is like a muscle biopsy looks like, so you always have this red part, which is uh, muscle fibers, and you have the whitish part, which is the surrounding fascia. So if you look at uh, the muscle physiology, let me remind you about this uh, topic. You've got the um, nerve, then there is the, X, the end plate, the motor end plate. There is the action potential going into the cell. And then basically there is the activation of the excitation contraction coupling process. Calcium leads to a contraction of the muscle cell. That's how physiology works. So that's how it looks like in the laboratory. So you have a, a cell under the microscope, a myofiber. And so you stimulate it 
and then calcium in increases. This is the green flashy thing, and the whole thing shrinks together. This is a contraction how it looks like in uh, the laboratory. And so what uh, you can measure then, you also can calculate some, some figures. If you calculate figures, then you will see that you get a contraction response. And if you look at different temperatures, 20, 20 degrees Celsius, small contraction, 40 degree, strong contraction, and faster. And it, it's logarithmic. So it's basically, it's just what you expect from biology, because myosin as an enzyme is highly energy de uh, temperature dependent. So if you use, do the same thing with fascial tissue and you measure the, the force of the tissue in this machine, you can see that it works the other way around. So it's completely diverse reaction at cold temperatures You've got a higher peak force in comparison to, to muscle, where you get a higher peak force at warm temperatures, and at warm conditions, less peak force. So obviously, the effects are completely uh, different. Uh, Why is this? Uh, um, by the way, other groups found the same behavior in, in facial tissue, so it's not only ours. Why is this so? So probably it has to do with our inhomogeneous temperature distribution. While you're sitting there, your temperature is quite cold in the forearm. It's 28 degrees, probably. If you do maybe therapy, if you do sports, if you run, you heat it up. So you heat it up to 40 degrees Celsius. So it's more than 10 degrees Celsius difference. So this means that the conditions in your, in your tissue change dramatically. So this means that, in other words, you can uh, say that you can influence the physiological conditions by changing the temperature. So when the temperature is low, then you have a high stiffness in fascial tissue and a high peak force, whereas in high temperature, you've got low stiffness and low peak force, according to the experiments in our lab. So why the, there is a balance? Probably because physiology is very smart. And so if you're not using your muscle too much, so if you're standing around in, in a cold church, whatever, then the workload is taken over by uh, fascial components, whereas during running, during sports, or when you need front crawl, you need every centimeter of, of speed what you can get then you need an immense, huge range of motion. So you should have a very flexible tissue then. And so if you heat up the tissue, if you do a really a warming up session, you probably can move your arm a bit more forward. And this might be better for competi competitive events in some sports, depending on the sports. Does temperature help for? for back pain? And the answer is yes. So a big Cochrane review, which they are very strict about the categories, and so they found several studies, and they, s they showed that it's quite a good evidence that a warm environment or local heat can reduce back pain on an acute level. This is an Olympic runner, and he's called Hussein Bolt. And if you look at his uh, recovery regime, I was told that he quite often uses the ice baths. So he's doing exactly the, the different things. Why is that? So I don't think it's very comfortable there. <laughs> but that's what they do. In the experiments, what you do, if you look at mouse tissue and you just crush it a bit, then you get an injury. You can just get histological slides. The slides uh, basically show that there is a regeneration phase, mononuclear cells in weight, and they change the tissue composition. The myofibers are degraded, and fascial components are degraded. And then later on, there is um, collagen deposits found in the tissue. So if you do icing, I was surprised to find different in the collagen deposits. 
So whereas you can have an um, icing group, which is shown on the right-hand side, and a non-icing group, and you look at the collagen chain deposits, which are here shown by these this little rows, then you could find that the collagen fiber area, after the 14 days after the injury, is higher in the icing group than in the non-icing group. And this effect gets even stronger after 28 days. So this means that the icing might influence make biomechanical properly properties of the tissue later on. And this might be important for specific sports. If you look at, I, I'm thinking about this ultramarathon stuff, when you rem remember the talk of Uwe Schütz, then you've, you've seen that the most important point for resignment, the most important reason for resignment, was pain in the soft tissue. So soft tissue pain uh, gave most people the reason for resignment. You, you got the pictures, MRI pictures, where you see all fascial inflammation here around the, the lower leg, and you also see this fascial inflammation on the subcutaneous fascia. So this means, in other words, maybe cooling icing could strengthen or could change properties and make uh, such uh, sports possible or influence the performance. So I want to know if you icing after exercise, what you are thinking about this topic. There is no, no right or wrong. Most of the people don't use it at all. I don't use it at all either. <laughs> but I'm, I'm not an, an athlete, so in uh, many conditions, probably there's no use for it. So interesting that uh, the second score was for uh, the sudden analgetic effect. So at least for back pain, this hasn't been shown, but many, many um, uh, athletes, they use it for uh, the sudden allergic effects and it's proven that instantly the um, nerve entrapment, uh, the, the nerve irrigation goes down. So let me, let me conclude. And uh, the conclusion basically, if we translate basic science into medicine, there is no answer, no clear answer. So again, a, a conclusion about the influence of the knowledge you acquired during the week course, what do you think? Does it change your daily work and at what scale? So does it change it in your everyday? No change at all. And this is just for me opinion polls to know if the f this fascia research conference... <laughs> ah, every day. So. <laughs> Top score. So finally, that's a good conclusion then. Thanks a lot for your attention. <laughs>